Hello, and welcome to Vision New England's Church in Action podcast. Here we talk with New England leaders about critical issues that impact how Christians engage in our culture to accelerate evangelism. Hello again, I'm Charles Gallagher. I'm the president of Vision New England. Welcome to the Church in Action podcast. Uh, we believe that when the people of God are known for doing the work of God and for unity, it's evangelistic. That's John 17, that's Matthew 5. Because when that happens, people want to know Jesus. That's why Jesus tells us to make disciples. Those are people who disadvantage themselves, like Jesus did, to serve others, to fix what's broken in our communities and the world, and share Jesus. So our podcast, we talk about issues of God and culture to accelerate our ability to make disciples who do justice and share Jesus to transform New England. Today, uh, my guest is Reverend Bonnie Gatchell, a new friend to me, but not a new friend to Vision New England. Uh, she's an alumni of Gordon-Conwell uh, Seminary, which so many of our guests are. It's a New England thing. Uh, but she's also the executive director and co-founder of Route One Ministry, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, but Bonnie, thanks so much for being with us. The, yeah, uh, so, of course. So, so Bonnie, maybe just to help people get started, because we want to talk about Route One Ministry and some other work that you've been doing, uh, can you share a little bit about just where are you from? When did you get saved? What was your call to ministry? A little bit of background. Yep, absolutely. But thank you for having me on. This is very exciting. And everything that you just said that this podcast is for, the hope uh, definitely lines up. And it resonates with me, my spirit, and the work of Route One. And so I'm excited you guys are doing this. I am originally from Michigan. I currently live in Boston, Mass, like actually in the city. Um, and so it was a, a bit of a switch, but for me, it like, feels like home, like Boston feels more like home than Michigan did. I grew up in a, a town of one stoplight and 6,000 people. Um, it's a farming community. In fact, my my dad's side of the family owns a farm. So there's like a Gatchel's farm if you're going to go to Michigan. Um, and it, where I grew up, I became, I committed my life to the Lord at 12 years old. So I grew up in a Christian home. My mom was a Sunday school teacher from age 16 until she was 60. And um, we were at church every time the doors were open. My parents sang in the choir. Um, and so definitely hearing the gospel and going to a gospel-centered church where we had to, I mean, this was old school, memorize scripture in order to uh, get points at vacation Bible school and stuff. And so as much as I'm like, well, that's a, a funny way to do that now, I'm grateful for the scripture I have memorized. It comes back to me in the funniest times and verses that I didn't necessarily know that I had memorized, you know, so that is my background. Very grateful for my parents and my grandparents, generations of believers. Um, and I think for my calling, I was living in the Dominican Republic, uh, teaching school to American kids. It was like a therapeutic situation when I was like 23 or 24. Um, and I was asked to preach at the church there, and this would be my first time preaching ever, and I hadn't gone to seminary yet, and so also with my conservative Christian Michigan background, I had to wrestle through, should I preach? Can I preach? What, is, what does that look like? And that wrestling just took place in me praying and consulting with the Lord for weeks, like every morning for weeks, and in one of those mornings, this memory came back to me of being six years old and pretending to be a pastor and my mom and my stuffed animals were my congregants and uh, it was very vivid and very tangible but what's interesting to me is that it was a memory that I had completely deleted you know and the Lord brought it back in that moment so I preached and the moment that I finished my sermon like the last word came off my lips I knew I was called to seminary. I knew I was called to the pastorate. So I came back to the U.S. to go to school at Gordon-Conwell. Had never been in New England before. Had never been in Boston before. 
stepped off the plane. The moment my feet hit the ground, I was like, this is it. I'm home. And that was like 16 years ago. So, yeah. And what, what made you pick Gordon Conwell, though, as opposed to going back to the Midwest? Or was there mm -hmm. some specific driver to bring you here? Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, um, I had applied to the seminary connected. So I went to Bible college. I went to Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and I had applied to the seminary connected to that because I thought, yeah, I'm going back to Michigan. And then I remember one of my professors from Cornerstone saying where I should go. So it's so, it's so funny how influential we are, right? He said, you should go to Gordon Conwell because they are more accepting of women getting their MDiv. And so I just kind of heard that sentence and I really respected this man. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll apply. But I also knew Gordon Conwell was quite prestigious. Yeah. So I was not, I wasn't planning on going. I didn't think I would get accepted mm -hmm. as like a real student. I thought I was going to do online stuff and ease in. And they wrote back and they're like, no, we'd, we'd like you to start this fall if that's possible. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. So you're, you're at Gordon Conwell, you graduate. Mm -hmm. And what happens then? Yep, that's great. Um, so I graduated from Gordon Conwell with my Master's of Divinity in 2009. And I really wanted the traditional pulpit. I really wanted the church with the pews and, you know, um, and so I began to apply for those jobs, but there weren't, there was either jobs that I was either definitely not qualified for, like senior pastor of Park Street Church, <laughs> and, or that I, that were kind of like, I was more than qualified. So it was like a 10 hour a week pastor like associate or senior or children's pastor so anyway so but I, I did end up taking a job in Lynn I worked for uh, Washington Street Baptist Church for a year as their youth pastor and loved what we were doing in Lynn I also ran their after school program um, they just weren't be they weren't able to pay me enough to like sustain livelihood yeah. but I loved what we were doing and I discovered there that I also I like being the person who plans things, right? I like being the person who puts activities together that's gonna help someone else take step forward. So we had kids from the neighborhood who had one parent or parents who were incarcerated, um, a really sweet boy who was like five years old, I wanna say, who walked him and his sister to church every Sunday by themselves. They just, you know what I mean? So I love, we would provide for them a snack and free tutoring and then game time. And so that was a lot of fun and where I discovered some more of my leadership skills. Um, but I still didn't have that traditional pulpit. So I just prayed, you know, I was like, maybe this is God shifting me out of New England the way he shifted me out of Michigan and the Dominican Republic. So I said, you know, God, I, I did another degree. I did a THM <laughs> at Gordon Conwell. And I was like, in this year, if a, a job doesn't pop up that's particular to my, my calling, my gifts, then I'm going to take it that you want me to go somewhere else and I'll just apply everywhere, right? Um, and in that year, I had a conversation with friends and over coffee in Starbucks in Beverly. And the question was asked, how can we reach women sexually exploited and trafficked here in Beverly and in the North Shore? And I thought, on the North Shore? And I think Amira was just birthing at the time or had barely like just started birthing. Um, and so the answer was make baskets and bring it to strippers working on Christmas Eve. And that resonated with me, uh, like my heart leaped. Um, and so the next day I called up a manager of a strip club that was near my church in Peabody and asked if we could bring baskets on Christmas Eve. And he said, yes, and he was confused as to why. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, I gotta think of a why besides I love Jesus, because I don't think that'll get us in the door. Um, and so he said, yeah, bring it, sounds harmless. Um, so we made 25 baskets as a church and they were just full of girly fun items like journals and lip gloss and earrings and, um, when we went that Christmas Eve, the women at, met us at the door, uh, 
they had tears in their eyes and they said, thank you. This is the only gift they would receive that Christmas. Um, this is the only gift I have for my daughter. They wanted hugs. And so I knew in that moment that this entire, this was an entire people group not being reached for the gospel. And so that was that, that was kind of the launch starting point for group one, um, which was my very non-traditional <laughs> pastorate. Well, so, so now I'm, I just want to, for folks who don't know Amira, Amira is an organization oh, right. based in Massachusetts, but they run safe homes uh, and, a, and programs for women who are exiting uh, human trafficking. And, and so they're just getting started. You're not involved in any ministry with them or on your own that's sexual exploitation driven. It's just this one conversation that gets yeah. you going on it. Wow. Well, yeah. And as I look back, I mean, I did go um, to a, an initial conversation about a safe house on the North Shore okay. uh, way back. Uh, but basically, yeah, it was this like this conversation. As I look back, the year before that, I went to the library and found um, Benjamin Skinner's book, A Crime So Monstrous. It's about labor trafficking, mostly in global. But I started reading it and I couldn't, par I couldn't put it down. But I, those things wouldn't have come to mind in that conversation. Yeah. So God's just kind of dropping a few things in and it's resonating. Mm -hmm. um, and then this conversation is like, you've got the kindling and it sounds like this is the one that lights the flame. Yeah. It yeah. Yeah. Is, and so, so you deliver those baskets and you clearly get a welcoming reception and has a, have, has a clear impact on, on women's lives. And mm -hmm. so where does that go from there? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yep, registered, like I said, that oh, there's something else going on here than what media has told me. Um, so I began to dig around into how do we build, or how do we connect with women in the strip clubs? Uh, on a regular basis. And I also remember very specifically saying, because I went home to Michigan because it's Christmas, um, to the deacon at my mom's church, I don't think I'm going to go into strip clubs because that seems counterproductive. That was on Sunday. Then on like Monday, I was talking to a woman in Kentucky who brought in hot homemade meals uh, into strip clubs. And heard her stories. And so I got in my car and I drove to Kentucky and shadowed her. And she actually let me stay at her house. She didn't know me. We haven't talked before or since. It's just a total kingdom thing, right? Um, I think it's like a loaves and fish type of situation with resources and knowledge. And so I went into the strip club um, and I say this, I, uh, I have a bit of, I have a TED talk and I say this sometimes in my like talk. So if you've already heard, this is a repeated joke, but with my MDiv tucked in my back pocket, I walked into the strip club, first time I'd ever been in a strip club, uh, New Year's Eve Eve, I was supposed to be in Montreal for a wedding, <laughs> but instead I was here um, and I met my first stripper and she was 62 years old and still stripping. And her daughter worked at the club with her and she looked 62. She had crow's feet and she had C-section scars and she clearly was very tired and her feet were bruised and broken. And I, in meeting her and looking in her eyes and hearing her story, I knew that this granny had no intentions of this being her career. And so I think that's what Route One does now. We uh, and have been for 10 years. We go into strip clubs and we meet women who work there and just unassumingly, non-judgmentally, but covered in prayer, build relationships with them. We say, here's our hands, here's our ears. What do you, what do you need from us? Or what is going on in your life? Or how can we laugh with you? How can we pray with you, cry with you, you know? Um, and so, yeah. Why, why do managers, what's your sense? Why do managers let you in? Because yeah, that was like a top, top five. Yeah, yeah it's a top five ministry. question. So, right, yeah, right. I remember first hearing about a ministry in Connecticut that does this. And that was my question then too. It's like, why would they let you in? And so what's your, what's your take? Yep. I, one, I obviously don't push too far after they let me in. I'm not like, why are you letting me in? Because I, you know. Right. Um, I would, I really think it just comes down to prayer and the, well, prayer and the Holy Spirit. So Route One has a policy 
and I learned this one the hard way, um, is we don't go into any strip clubs that we haven't prayed over from the parking lot for at least four to six months weekly. Um, and so, yeah, and I sometimes lose volunteers in that requirement and uh, place people that have wanted to be trained by me, but I just, I've, I've seen it make a real difference in what we do. And, and I would say this with prayer is our biggest tool as Christians um, to address trafficking. It, it never expires. It doesn't run out. And yet we, I think we underutilize it. Um, so, but th that being said, <laughs> basically, yeah, that's what I think. And I also think everyone's multi-dimensional, right? So the men in the very first strip club that we went into um, that Christmas, I would find out later are, were raised Catholic and grew up in the Catholic church and had parents that go to church and I assume love Jesus, you know, and they started by owning a restaurant and just realized they could make more money selling flesh. And, and so when you're talking to the women, approaching the women, how does, what does that conversation look like? Or, and are they receptive to the conversation mm -hmm. always, or do you get pushback from them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we go in with little gifts, like it might be a, a bottle of nail polish with a tag that says you are treasured. And um, that's, we just start that way after doing some prayer. Um, we usually just drop them at first, like the bouncer takes them from us. Then it's a couple, I would say a couple of weeks. It's usually a dancer who invites us in because after receiving these gifts every week, she is usually like, who, who are these people that want to give strangers a gift, want to give dancers a gift? Um, so they invite us in. And this just slowly over time. So I would say like the first couple of weeks, there isn't much conversation. The women are pretty skeptical. I think a couple of months actually, uh, pretty skeptical of us. But then it just takes one, one of the women, one of the dancers to say that they want to talk with us. And then the other dancers see them talking to us for quite some time. I mean, they'll talk for about 30, 45 minutes straight. Um, because we go purposely when it's slow. We go when it's not, we don't go on the weekends, you know? And so when that happens, then the other dancers realize they can trust us. And, you know, it's back and forth sometimes. Like we might go one night and every volunteer has a woman who they've connected with who's sharing their story, right? And other nights we might be in and out. We just go in do some prayer under our breath and leave. Um, so, but the women are receptive. There are a few women, a few times who are just not sure. They're just, I think they're just not sure the whole time who we are. And so they never talk to us, but we've, yeah, we've had women show us their bruises. We've had women bring in their English homework so we could tutor them in the dressing room. We've had women tell us that they've started doing their driver's ed class so they could get a license to get out of this work. Um, they've invited us to their houses for birthday parties, their kids' birthday parties. So, and we, and we go, um, yeah, yeah. And, and so now you, you just made an interesting point that, uh, that, that I want to drill down on. So it's going into the clubs, it's only women in your ministry. Yeah. And, yeah. and is there a role for men? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I have men on my the board of directors, obviously, and we. I have a man right now who runs our website. He does all the editing, Eric Larson. He would not want me to give him a shout out because he's so, I want to serve behind the scenes quietly, but he's done such good work for us for years. He's volunteered and that's a skill set I completely lack. So I'm so grateful. Um, we've had men uh, do the job of volunteering to be advocate speakers. So going to churches and sharing what we do, why we do what we do, talk about trafficking. Um, I can use men. If, if there's a man who would like to be an administrative assistant, I am definitely hiring right now. And I think men, again, especially men in the church, I mean, you, can, can, you can continue to change the conversation, right? When a fellow guy that you're out with, and I know this is asking you to be very brave, 
makes fun of a stripper or says, oh, I know that girl wanted it because of how she's dressed. You have a pretty important role that men can do that women can't because it's guy to guy to say, actually, no, this is what I know about dancers. This is what I know about women in the clubs, or this is how I think we should speak about women in general, right? So that's an important role. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a misperception too that we don't play a role in it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I know, um, I remember somebody making a, uh, a joke one time about a, a strip club in Danbury, she's saying they're driving by and one of their kids said, well, who goes to those kinds of places? And one of the other ones said, well, it's not people like Mr. Galda. Um, and she just kind of shared that as a joke. And I've not been to one, but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily true across the church. Yeah. It's, as we think it is, but I've had women in the church tell me about their church fathers who yeah. did go to a strip club. So it's not as foreign to us as we think. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, that's absolutely fair. In fact... One of um, the trainings that we did with pastors on what is trafficking, what's happening in New England, um, because we're across three of the largest cities in New England, so we're actually in Worcester, Springfield, and Boston. Uh, one of the pastors flat out told me afterwards, like it was a side conversation, that he has men in his church who are getting married, and they say, oh, we're going to the strip club one last time, and all he says to them is, be careful. And so, yeah, so it's definitely, and we see all sorts of men in the clubs. I mean, they are broken as well. So as much as I say, women, no little girl wants to be a stripper when she grows up. No little boy wants to buy sex when he grows up. He wants a nurturing, but somewhere along the lines, he's been wounded and doesn't believe that's available to him, or he's become callous and doesn't want that to be available to him. This is easier to control, you know? Um, and so that can't just be happening in the secular world. Yeah. And, and so do women uh, through your ministry decide to leave the strip club world and do they all have the freedom to do it or how to mm -hmm. talk a little about that if you would, please. Yeah, I think it's really tricky for them to leave. So I, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about women who work in the strip clubs. Uh, repeatedly. I, the women that we've met have been stripping in the clubs for 10, 12 years, and they're only 23, or they're only 24, or they're only 26. That means they absolutely started when they were a minor. And in fact, what we know is here in the United States, the average age of entry into the sex industry is 12 years old. Um, so if you enter something at 12, even a, a good habit, like reading, your book, reading a book every night before you go to bed, and then somebody comes along and you're 23 now, 24, and says, you shouldn't read a book every night before you go to bed because you're going to go blind. It's a, it's a difficult thing to take 10, 12 years of uh, a habit and to shift. And then when that habit is abuse, right? Uh, men abusing you, you abusing yourself, um, and it's connected to you not being in poverty or you supplying for the children that you have or even a drug habit, there's an even bigger grip. So it's a, it's a hard hurdle. I would say that every woman who works in the strip club is exploited and some of the women who work in the strip club are trafficked. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, you're reminding me of a friend at a breakfast at church one time when I yeah, finished my breakfast and he, he leaned over to me and said, your mother used to make you clean your plate. I was kind of like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he just pointed at my plate and it was clean. And I'm like, and, and it's one of those habits that I don't yep. even think that there's something else to do. I just continue yes. doing it, right? Yes. And it sounds yeah. like the same thing. And, and I think uh, talking to some other women who I know who have been trafficked, uh, they would talk about, and, and you're, con you're convinced that there's not another option. Yeah. And you're convinced nobody's going to help you because you're of no value. Yeah. You see that in your work? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I recently just finished Rachel Moran's book, Paid For, which is a great one. Um, and she talks about that was the first step of her getting free from prostitution was somebody paid her to write her stories. Uh, it was like a newspaper or a magazine. And this is in Ireland. 
paid her to write her story. She loved writing, but she never thought that she could get paid to do something that she enjoyed versus paid for something that she despised, right? So I was like, that's huge. So we, when we go into the clubs after we've built some relationship with the women, we do ask them that question, what do you enjoy? What do you enjoy? What do you think you're good at? And we try to listen for those things too, right? When they tell us that they they support their family, th story after story, it's clear that they are the supporter of their family. I don't mean financially, but emotionally. We speak to that. Oh, it sounds like you're a really good supporter. It sounds like you've had to parent your parents. What if you got a job in the social work world, right? What, you know, and so it's like helping them make these connections to, I am a, a person, I am a human. Um, I think for so long for the women to be in this work and for some of them to be in there since they were 12, 13, 14 years old and their bodies not to be overly graphic, but to be honest, instead of thinking of their body as a body, but thinking of it as um, an object to be used by men, you got to make that shift. To make that shift takes time and healing. And it's a process. It's also dangerous for some of them if they leave, for the women that are trafficked, for the women that have boyfriends at home that are taking their money and wanting their money. For them to leave, they need to know they have a safe place to go to. Um, and they have to really decide it deep in their center, right? Um, because some pretty violent people could come after them. So yeah, yeah. So, so some women do leave, but I know from our conversations, it's a long time to happen. Yeah. And and so what share with us, if you would, someplace where you saw God do something that yeah. was cool, exciting, unusual, what have you. That's great. Yeah. I will um, tell a couple snapshot stories if we have time. Is that yep. okay? So um well, one time in one of our clubs in Springfield, actually a bouncer, this big bouncer smack dab in the middle of the strip club, asked one of our volunteers to pray for him. And they, they prayed for him right there on the spot. And then when they looked up, he had tears coming down his eyes. And six months later, we got a little note uh, that he had left the clubs and he started working in the local hospital. Um, in some kind of form or capacity. So that, I mean, just indirectly, the work that we do when we show up um, is affecting people. And that's not the only bouncer or managers have shared their stories with me, their wrestlings, right? So, but a journey story from one of the women, um, we'll call her Kay. Uh, so we met Kay in one of the strip clubs and each week Kay would share with us what's going on in her life, a little bit about her addictions, a little bit how she did have a Christian home that she came from, but she she ran away from her parents' house. So she hasn't been to church in years. She had three kids when we first met her. Um, and she would always say how she wanted to leave the clubs, how she, she thought maybe she could do something different, but she didn't know what that would look like or how the money would come in. And so that would be the conversation, that that particular conversation uh, every week for four years. She would meet with the volunteer that came in. She made a connection immediately with our volunteer, Lori, who's now on staff, and we're super blessed by that. Um, and just kind of share her woes every week with Lori. And Lori would just sit with her and listen and encourage her where she could encourage her to be brave and take steps and that we're here to help. And so that's what it was. It was four years of processing. And that means a lot of prayer on our part. It becomes a little bit long suffering too. When you see this woman could do something and she's so close, it's just like one little dial. Right. Um, and then the clubs got shut down because of COVID. Right. And so we, we couldn't go into the clubs and then July of this year, we got a text from Kay that, oh, and the last time we saw her, she was pregnant in November, big and pregnant and still working in the strip clubs. Um, <clears throat> and so we were worried about her because she just kind of disappeared, right? In December, we didn't see her. In January, we didn't see her. We're like, oh no, what, what happened here? 
And so we got this text in July and it was long. It was really long. And she said, hey, I just want you to know I've left the strip clubs. I've returned to church. I'm no longer using drugs. Um, and I couldn't do it without you ladies coming in. And so I, you know, I just take very seriously the text that says, where light is, darkness has to flee, right? And that at the name of Jesus, slaves are set free. And so that's what we take with us into the clubs. You know, we don't go with tracks or Bibles. We pray, we get very prayed up <laughs> and we go in and we listen. And so, yeah. You also do something that we're not always good at in the church, right? Because when you talk about spending four years with someone, Mm. Right, and mm. not seeing demonstrable progress. Or we're, we're happy to spend two weeks with you, but mm -hmm. we can lose our attention span or, mm -hmm. okay, well, this is a lost cause. Let me move on, right? And so that investment of four years in someone and hearing the same story for four years is a big deal that we're not always good at. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for making that investment, right? And it's probably a good reason why more guys aren't in your ministry, because we're going to be the ones tomorrow. Okay, got to move on, guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I so, think you're uh, right. I mean, I think really quickly, sorry, is one thing I've learned over the past year in doing some work with the Allender Center, which is a great organization out in Seattle, a Christian trauma center, is the grief part, right? As Christians, we love, we love Friday because that's the day that Christ died for us. And we love Sunday because that's when resurrection happens. But are you willing to sit in Saturday with people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's, a great, it's a great point. Our, we have a mutual friend, Victoria Kabarik, who uh, is one of the women yeah. leading this group uh, for women in Christian leadership. And I was on the, okay, so Victoria, let's get a meeting schedule. Let's get people out. Let's, it's like, you're being a man. Stop it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need to build relationship. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's what I think yeah, what I'm hearing in your work is so clear in that is that that relationship and then the relationship got does stuff. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. So that's that's a great ministry. Bonnie. Thank you for sharing that. I do want to shift a little bit um, okay. because un, kind of, I guess, unrelated, but kind of related to that work. You've been doing some research. And so can you talk a little bit, I want to talk about the findings, but I'd like to talk about what the research is and why you did it and kind of the process you went through. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, we did the research be for a couple of different reasons. I think <clears throat> one is, so one part of one that we didn't talk about is we also do education uh, of Christian Christians, congregations, Christian leaders, community leaders on trafficking and uh, trafficking 101, what is exploitation, pornography. And so every time, every church I've spoken at or a staff of Route 1 has spoken at, maybe maybe it's the church's 40 people, uh, 600 people by Zoom in person, there's at least one woman who comes up to us and says, I've been sexually abused and I, you're the first person I'm telling. And that woman is usually in her 50s. And that's one of my favorite moments, uh, to be honest. And I love, I feel honored that these women have let me hold their stories with them. Um, but I thought something's going on here. For this woman to be in her 50s and for me to be the first person she felt safe enough to tell. And she's been in church since she was born. Like there, there's some kind of miss, right? And so we just thought, what if we dug into what maybe the miss could be? So what we did is... Um, my wonderful intern, Emma Breyer, last summer, and God bless her, she did it all by Zoom. Uh, but we interviewed more than 100 pastors, um, all of which had to have served in a traditional pastorate role for 10 years or more. So most everyone we spoke to were senior pastors or solo pastors. And we particularly stayed with pastors here in the state of Mass, Commonwealth of Mass, and all men for a particular reason. We wanted to get a good understanding of how male pastors who have been leading a church are addressing their congregations. What do they think about men and women and sex? What do they think about pornography? What do they think about domestic violence and sexual harassment and how they address those issues? Um, so, so sorry, just to be clear. So the women who are talking to you, they're not necessarily talking about this happened to me in church. They're just saying this happened to me. And so mm -hmm. you're trying to get at 
So what is the church doing about this equipping, training? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. thanks, thanks, appreciate it. Yep, no, thank you. I'm sorry if I was unclear. No, yes. no, no, I'm And slow. some of them, it did happen by pastors and it did happen by deacons. Um, it did happen by elders. I also know many women in the strip clubs who have finally found their way to church. And then when they sit down in the pew, the man in front of them is the man who bought them the night before, right? And so I just, these things are happening. I also know of a uh, sound theological seminary where the Dean of Students, uh, a woman, a married woman came to her and said, my husband's beating me. And she put the abused woman and the abuser in the same car to take them to the police station. I was like, so it's just huge, like misconceptions. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry to sorry to stop you. So so you're you so you start doing those research projects is looking at what churches and pastors are doing to train, equip, raise awareness, and 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 so and that's all interviews on Zoom. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, because it was smack dab at the height of um, COVID last summer, and yeah, so some very interesting things came out of we're, those. I just went before, back and rewatched some of them. But before we before we go into the what you what you learned, yeah. just want to hear. So, how receptive were folks to having this conversation with somebody I, who I presumably is cold calling them, saying, "I want to talk about what you do on sexual harassment." What yeah. were folks receptive to the conversation? Um. Yeah. Actually, for the most part, I think some of the people just didn't know what they were going to contribute to the conversation. I think some of the pastors got concerned. That we were going to ask something of them afterwards, like um, to I don't know to give money or some kind of. Uh, there were there were pastors who declined right to to meet with us to talk about the issue, um, and there were just some pastors who wanted some clarity, which is wise on their part to be honest. Wanted clarity before we did the Zoom. We made known to everyone that their their name would be left anonymous. So we made like you know a way to do that. And um, that the interviews would be internal only. Um, and so that, I think that helped. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. And so what did you find then? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I brought, I brought uh, notes with me so I wouldn't forget. Um, so what I found is that across the board, there seems to be this understanding, not with every pastor, but that sexual abuse, sexual harassment, domestic violence, that those, those sins should be reconciled the same way that we would reconcile if someone got into an argument, right? If you and I were to get into an argument, I might call you up a day or two later and say, you know what, Charles, I got a little heated. You know what I mean? But that's not the case, right? When someone's been violated, sexually or physically um, by someone, there is a, there's a different type of reconciliation. Those people can't necessarily um, continue in an intimate relationship, right? Nor, nor should they. There needs to be some kind of defense on the part of the victim by the leader of the church. And so there, there was a bit of this under, misunderstanding. Um, me, I me think, by, me by yeah. That pastors are saying, "Hey, look! If if a woman were to come to me and say she was uh, she was beaten by her husband, mm -hmm. my solution to that is kind of the two elders of the church go talk to each other and let's bring them together and go through some kind of a kind of normal reconciliation process that we might go through if if we just disagreed about what was happening in the church parking lot and had a fight yeah. that needed to be reconciled. Is, is that what you're? Is that what I'm hearing right?" Yeah, I'm glad you slowed me down. Thank you. Um, I would say 70% of the pastors that we spoke to, now again, these are senior pastors or solo pastors, so they are the authority in the room. 70% of the pastors um, did the same as that theological seminary. They would bring the husband and the wife in together. So if we stick with domestic violence, they would bring the husband and the wife in together and they would now, it's good that you hear both sides because false accusations are made as well, right? But they would hear their stories and then they would they would 
go about it like yes yes like it was just a normal situation like a, a fight in the parking lot over a parking space or whatever it might be they would ask the wife to forgive the husband and the husband to forgive the wife and then um, put the wife back into the home and so there's that part there was this what I observed is that churches with all male leadership uh, so male all male elders all male deacons all male pastors those are the ones that have the sex scandals, right? Um, and I think that um, there's this weird story was told where the woman was sent to counseling, but not the husband. And so it's just like, I understand the woman does need therapy, right? To process her trauma, but it just makes the victim feel even more so that shame and guilt, like they've done something wrong when really, it's the perpetrator. Um, we found that nine out of 10 pastors will side with the perpetrator over the victim. Um, and um, you mean the perpetrator says this doesn't happen or didn't happen. And so they just side with them or meaning that. No, the perpetrator, even when they say, yep, I might have got too violent with my wife or yeah, I've been sexually harassing this woman or I've yeah, I, you're right. I did rape her. The pastor, for whatever reason, nine out of 10 pastors um, don't want to remove the perpetrator from church. They just feel like that's too much or this person needs love too. And so if we ask them to leave church, then, then they're not going to get the care that they need. In the meantime, the victim, who's most, most of the time women, but not always, now doesn't feel comfortable to worship at her church, right? So now she has been abused. She's felt that shame and she has to find a new congregation to fellowship with, you know? Um, <clears throat> and so um, so she's so she's got a couple of issues happening or, or the victim, we should say, has yeah. a couple of issues happening. Um, one is they probably broken trust with their pastor at that point too. They've got a physical safety. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. so they've got... The, the trauma of the thing that they may not have worked through at this point too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that they're kind of, it sounds like in most cases, kind of left to fend for themselves, if you will. Is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's a little bit of my own story as well. I was worshiping at a church and this guy started harassing me um, and finding me and sending me messages and what he wanted to do with me. And I brought it to my pastor and the pastor uh, called the guy in and heard his side of the story and addressed it with me. Like, um, I need to be patient with this man because of the man's race, because of his economic situation. Um, and I said, well, I don't feel comfortable coming to this church anymore if so-and-so is here worshiping. And the pastor said to me, good luck. I hope you find a good church. Um, and so that seems to be the story that I hear from women over and over again. And that's why for me, as a pastor and as someone who believes in the local church, I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't believe in the local church. I believe in Paul's words that fellowshipping among believers is a good thing. I want us to do better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So sometimes we're a little bit too fast on, on in this area. And I, I think in a couple of <clears> others <throat> we've seen where we're a little too fast on the forgive and reconcile um, when there's actual some other, we need to get to that, but there's some other work that needs to happen first. Yeah. And that's, that. I'm so glad you brought that up. And this connects back to the other thing. Can you sit in someone Saturday? Because it's the woman who's been abused or been harassed or whatever it might be or the man right that's their trauma it's not your trauma as the pastor and it can feel unnerving I know as a pastor to not know what to do in a situation or how to help someone heal and you're also sometimes I think pastors feel guilty and you shouldn't like oh, this perpetrator has been in our congregation. Why didn't I see it? Well, they're a perpetrator for a reason. They're good at covering up their sin, just like each of us are good at covering up our sin, right? And so don't beat yourself up and don't make it about you. Be patient with this woman or this man. And 
connect them to a Christian therapist who's going to walk through their Saturday with them and let them do it at their own pace. It is not your trauma. And if you rush them, they're not going to be able to um, take hold of the full healing and recovery that Jesus so desperately wants for them, you know? We were able to look at the data to see if big churches handled it different than small churches. We have the perception that big churches have more resources, expertise. So did you find any correlation there or not really? No, no. Uh, big churches, small churches, Baptist churches, white churches, Asian churches. There seems to be a predominant like situation across the board. Here's what I did found is pastors who had a clear mission statement for their church really understood the issue. They still didn't necessarily have the resources, but the, the pastors who, when we asked them the question, what's your mission statement? The ones who said to me, our mission statement is, were typically the ones who at least understood the, the layers of the issue. Um, the ones who didn't have a clear mission statement, some pastors said, I don't really like to talk about mission statements or get stuck on mission statements. They were the ones who were a little more foggy on what the situation was. Does that, does that make sense at all? Or well, I don't it, know why. Yeah. I haven't drawn the connection of why, but that just yeah. seems to be clear. Yeah, the, the correlate that there is a correlation between those two things makes sense. Why there's a correlation between those two things. <laughs> you know, the only thing I could speculate is that does, does one speak to a level of training that yeah, I value maybe. and have and execute on mission, does that speak to a level of training that also then happens to correlate with I've got training in other areas too? That would be, uh, but that's like wild guess on my part. Yeah, I mean, and I haven't, because I just re-listened to the interviews and getting ready for this podcast. The, uh, last week, I've been reading, listening to a couple over time and I, I wish I would have sat down and thought about why, I mean, if we wanted to go like the spiritual direction, I would say like scripture does talk about people with vision, right? Go forward, people who don't have vision perish. Um, yeah. So I think, I think also just the attitude about it, right? Like it felt like the, the men, the pastors who didn't have a mission statement, they themselves didn't want to be hemmed in or held accountable. But when you put a mission statement out there, like you just did with this podcast, you're accountable to those words. So yeah. maybe that is coming, like playing out, but I really appreciated uh, the pastors who understood the issue. There was a couple of pastors. They also understood it at all the layers, right? The abuse, yeah, sexual abuse is quite violent. It's it, no matter what it is, if it's um, um, touching, groping over the clothes, there's a, vi there's a certain violation that happens when our, our genitals, our reproductive organs, our, the ability to make more image bearers, those body parts are spoken against, right? Or, and I mean, spoken against by being acted against. There's something that happens there that's different than my friend lying to me or stealing my books or, right, taking money out of my bank account. And as I say that, I'm fearful that some women and men are gonna hear, see it was my fault or I'm eternally broken. And that is not true. That is a lie of the enemy, mm. right? Well, and, and so I'm thinking, so, so I guess if we're looking for good news, there is some that some are aware of this. And mm -hmm. some, yeah. I know in my own church experience, we did, we, some of the women in the single group pointed to a guy uh, and said, hey, there's an issue there. Uh, and it was treated seriously. And I wound up being, this is the, you know, the not fun part about being an elder is you got, right now it's my job, two elders and a staff member sat down and talked with a guy and uh, said all the right things, yeah. but it was clear, right? Yeah. If you really just read it, we brought in somebody else who was really sensitive to reading people. If you read it, we all agreed this guy, no, this is not right. Um, yeah. He hasn't done anything here, but it was just a sense the women had. And so yeah. we were willing to act even on the sense yeah, there's a problem here. Um, and he wasn't allowed to come. We, you know, we, we created a structure where you could come to church, but mm -hmm. we, we'd have the thing of, but you got to tell us when you're coming to church, you're going to be with this person. You're not allowed to be away from that person, right? All those kinds of things. Um, but you're not allowed to go to the singles group anymore. And when we did that, he didn't want to come to the church anymore. 
Well, and yeah, exactly. Tells you, right? You've shown some light into his darkness and, you know, um, and I, I want to then take this back to the, the patients thing too, is in my situation, and I think in a lot of other people's situations, it's not just being patient with the woman to work through her trauma or the man, right? In the pace that she needs to, not what you prescribe for her, right? But also the patients let the perpetrator repent. And that might take a year. That might take several years. It might take six months. But like what you did, that's beautiful. You and other elders sitting with this man and hearing his story and him not wanting to repent or wanting to make a confession or wanting to get accountability. Um, I, I think that that's what you need to wait for because it's also about their healing. They're abusing people because of their own brokenness as well. And I would guess because they were abused earlier in life also, you know? And so uh, we want healing for everybody, you know? And so I think um, there are other ways to handle it. If, if you're a pastor and you really feel convicted, like, well, I don't want to ask this man or woman to leave just because they're the perpetrator, because where are they going to find the gospel? Well, can you assign, according to gender, a couple of men or a couple of women who are strong in the faith to walk beside this person? ask them to leave for a moment, ask them to go to therapy, put in some steps that if they're willing to do it, they could be brought back into the congregation, you know? Um, and then what about the victim? You not making the perpetrator leave says to the victim, what happened to you is okay. Yeah. And so now, Bonnie, I'm, um, so let's say I'm one of these pastors and I was one of the ones who didn't seem to be keyed into the issue, didn't have a good process <clears throat> or thinking about what to do. What do I do? If now, but now I'm convinced. Now I'm saying, okay, there's something wrong here. I need to do something about. It. What do I do? Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I want to. I do want to say quickly, in fairness, that no matter where the pastor was on the timeline, people, there were men who really understood the issue and men who were just out to lunch. Um, all of them wanted help. All of them. We asked if there was a resource available to you to help you understand sexual abuse and how to respond and domestic violence. Would you want it? Every pastor said yes. Every pastor. So that's a big deal, yeah. right? Um, I I think a couple of things. Um, you're saying that you're a pastor. You're like, oh, okay, we should do something. Um, there are 52 Sundays in a year. You could spend one talking about domestic violence, talk flat out, calling it out as sin, uh, flat out saying that if you are being violated by your spouse, feel free to move out of the home. You don't have to get divorced, you know, but get separated, get safe. Um, I think that we as a church in general, capital C, um, we idolize marriage. So a lot of times in these stories, I hear more of an emphasize, emphasis on reconciling marriage, reconciling marriage, because it's so important to reconcile the marriage. Why? Why is that more important than one person's safety and sanity and healing right well, the, the the you know but the challenge in that i'm going to guess because i think back to my own church experience if yes. you should have a sermon on this i think my initial reaction will be well we don't need to have a sermon on that a everybody knows it and b nobody here has that problem that's right that is yes you almost just quoted uh one of the interviews i listed he's like i don't i don't think that we have because we asked about all these things pornography sexual harassment abuse and domestic violence. And he didn't think the men in his church had a problem with pornography, which we know from statistics they do. Um, so yes, that is it. And the idea of, um, well, everyone knows that domestic violence is wrong. If that were true, then um, married Christian couples would not be divorcing at the same rate as the secular world. Not that every Christian couple that gets divorced is a domestic violence situation, but that's got to come into play. Right. Um, and I think it speaks to honestly what we think about women, because if women are more more so than men, the ones who are affected by domestic violence, right, the victims of domestic violence, then for us to not spend 25 percent of women actually are victims of domestic violence. And for us, if there were 25 percent 
of people in our congregation suffering from cancer, you better believe we would do a whole sermon on cancer, you know? And so why not domestic violence? Why not sexual harassment? And, and um, in fairness, we do know all kinds of things are wrong and doesn't stop us from doing it. Well, but that is, that's the other thing too. But it does, so here's my thought is, I go to churches or other Route 1 staff go to churches and we talk very bluntly about strippers and trafficking and abuse and what's happening because I'm willing to go there, because I'm willing to use all the right words for all the body parts and to call out sexual abuse as sin or to talk about sex at all. I think that's why women feel safe to say to me, I've been abused. So I think the other thing that we can do in the church is start talking about sex and start talking about it more appropriately. Uh, a woman's clothing does not designate her sexual availability, right? And that's one thing that is told over and over again in the church, explicitly and implicitly. If a woman has sex outside of marriage, she's called all these violent names, right? But if a boy, a man has sex outside of marriage, He's just, boys would be boys. And we have to make this shift, right? Only the woman was brought to Jesus, right? That yeah, right. Been a man. Exactly. <laughs> this is Where's the, the time. first, yes. Yeah. And so is there, is there a, uh, if I'm saying, hey, look, I wish there was a book on this. I could, you know, yeah, get, is, is there a book, podcast? What, what, what would you point me to on that? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that question. I would say the other thing, let me, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I can't emphasize this more. Uh, all of us go through trauma. Some of us have faced capital T trauma, like rape, like a house burning down, like a spouse getting into an accident and not being the same person anymore. But everybody this side of heaven has experienced trauma. Maybe it's lowercase t. So I would say if you're a pastor of a church, if you're a pastor in any way, shape, or form, and you haven't at least spent some time in therapy, you should do that, mm. right? Uh, you should do the work and because that's going to help you be more available for your congregants. Yeah. Um, you can only take people as far as you've gone yourself, right? Yeah. Um, I, so I mean, that's. I've talked to a lot of pastors and they are doing, especially this past year, and they are doing therapy and they're like, it is invaluable in my ministry uh, to be in therapy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not Absolutely. all, right? It's not dangerous. It's not a, right. There is therapy that is counterproductive. We all know, but there is therapy that is good and useful. And we've got some resource at Vision New England that folks would uh, are looking for that, that we can point you to. That's great. I, yes. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I would say, sure. Vision New England. If you have resources and you have therapists or you have a list of therapists or connections, reach back out to you guys, get on your website, find those things. Uh, one I have found to be very helpful, the Allender Center, and it's spelled A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R. But if you just Google the Allender Center, it's in Seattle. They are one of the few Christian therapeutic places that speaks to trauma, speaks to abuse in a way that um, is keeping with the whole person, right? Uh, Dan Allender is a man who was repeatedly sexually abused by different people in his childhood. Um, and he took all of that and turned it into this beautiful program. Um, they have st weekend story hours where you come and you have to share a bit of your story and narrative. Those are helpful. So just get on the Allender Center, uh, org. I bet you is what it is. But if you Google it, you'll find it. They have Bob will put it in the window for people to Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, they have podcasts on trauma. They have podcasts on trauma related to race, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's free. And then they have all sorts of other resources from things that you can purchase for your home where you're just going to do it on your own, an online course around trauma, as well as like I participated in a year-long program that right now is 100% online. So if you thought, I would love to do a year-long program, but I can't go to Seattle every other month. Right now is your time. <laughs> and uh, weekend programs. That's one. Um, if you're in the Boston area, this is very narrow to Boston, sorry. Roxbury Presbyterian Church every Thursday at 7.30 has a trauma center. And I think it's actually online right now. And they're great. Excellent work happened in there. And I think that's now part of the Boston Collaborative as, as well. So folks may know it through that too. Oh, well, great. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then a book that changed my life is called The Body Keeps Score. And it just talks about when we go through trauma, again, maybe it's a car accident, maybe it's sexual abuse, but on the spectrum in between that, that has to stay in our body. That has to, like, it just doesn't exit. It's in our body somewhere. And I, it was just very helpful to me. Um, he is a therapist here in the Boston area, but it's really great. Um, Dan Allender's book, Healing the Wounded Heart, very powerful, really great. And I think I did write down a couple other things, but I might have missed. If you get them to us, Bob will add it to the, the chat. So don't worry about that. The, um, uh, and, and Bonnie, if folks want to find your ministry. Yep. Root1ministry.org with one spelled out. Am I right? Uh -oh. oh, loved by Root1. Loved, loved by Root1. Root but with Root one. is like uh, the highway. But yes, all of it spelled out. So, so loved by Root1, not the number, but spelled out.org. Yes, sir. Yep. Thanks. Well, yep. Bonnie, I could go on. We're at the one hour mark. I apologize because I have a bunch <laughs> of questions. I'd love to follow up and hear more on this. So maybe we'll be able to talk again at some point. But thank you so much. Uh, not just for spending your time for us, but we're grateful for that, but really for this critical ministry and the research that you're doing uh, and helping mm. us understand what, when Jesus talks about when the people of God do good works, the world sees it, notices, helping us understand what that good works looks like. And so I'm grateful to you for that as well. And so, thanks, so Charles. Thanks. sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just, I wanted to say, and I didn't plan this, but I do feel like I want to say it. If you're listening to this and you are someone who has suffered abuse and you don't feel like you have anyone to talk to about it or you've told people and they're not listening, please go to our website. My number's listed there. My email's listed there. I will listen. Um, and so I just want you to have that available to you. Great point. Thank you very much for doing that. And, and so, uh, so thank you for our audience as well uh, for listening. I hope you heard some things in this uh, that's mm -hmm. convicting, edifying, um, encouraging, um, challenging, um, and that if you're in a church and your church doesn't have this, right, whether you're an elder, lay, pastor, right, there's resources for you and there's a, a clear need. Um, and maybe we need to rethink some things about what we presume about the folks that sit in front of us on a Sunday and, and, and vice versa, who preach in front of us on a Sunday. Uh, but thanks, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and Bob, I'd like to thank our producer, Bob Atherton. Uh, and so uh, uh, Bob makes all of this happen uh, behind the scenes, and we're grateful for him. Uh, our next week podcast, we'll have Pastor Sergio Perez with us. Uh, Sergio is the senior pastor at Harvest Ministries of New England. He's also the founder of Copani, which is the Fellowship of Hispanic Pastors of New England. And, uh, he's, uh, and he's also a member of our board. Uh, and so uh, he will be with us. So just sharing uh, his view on what he sees God doing in his part of New England, uh, what he sees uh, God doing in Latino churches, uh, and uh, and some uh, and how he thinks about evangelism in New England. And so that'll be a fun one. So I'll see you then. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for joining the podcast today. If you'd like to learn more about Vision New England and what God is doing in our region, check out our website at visionnewengland.org. We hope you'll join us next time for the Church in Action podcast.